All right, I'm starting this stream. Is there. it going there or did it go somewhere else? Well, let's see here. I had to close out my uh, preview of YouTube while I was doing this thing. I feel like this episode just got like extra sexy and unauthorized. <laughs> We're fugitives now. We. <laughs> so that's what's really happening in the future of the Marvel Universe. Um, <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Every detail of it. You heard it here first. Every, Every major character thing. death and plot twist laid yeah. out for you all. So, yeah, make bets with your friends. <laughs> Uh, anyway, welcome back to VFX and Chill, the show where we break rules I and laws and think... <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, welcome back. We are uh, here uh, with Perceptions John Lepore and Doug Appleton, who are the Emmy Award nominated. Uh, what is what is the title that you that you prefer? Visionary artist. Uh, well, that's a Go lot as of big as you can. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, there's uh, the artist, Eagle. the Emmy Eagle. Award losing artist oh. for. <laughs> oh, that not. No. Listen, I think what I like is that I can now say that Oprah and I have both lost Emmys, and I think hey. there's something. Finally, there's something to that. No, in all honesty, it was. Super. It was. Uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, the Emmys and just being a part of that. Yeah, it was was really awesome. I think you know the pretty much you know the and this is the first time that we've been nominated for anything that feels like a big legitimate award like this. So that was really really thrilling for for us. And I think we you know I think we had very incredibly reasonable expectations. Probably up until like the three hours before the Emmys when like Doug and I started talking about like how we would get a, a the rest of our EGOT. And, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but in all in all seriousness, uh, was was really awesome to get that recognition. And uh, and I'm also thrilled that in in losing that we lost to uh, Good Lord Bird, which great was title sequence, my favorite of all of the yeah. other sequences. I would have been I would have been bummed if like we had lost to something that was crappy. But uh, call him out. That's what one? I was going to say. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, it was the 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 doc mcstuffins title sequence i thought just it didn't, didn't live up to the hype know, they didn't hit that signature <laughs> dark tone but, uh... speaking of uh award shows what what was your uh, favorite part of uh, the emmys in general uh darby Sasento, who wants to make sure you know he exists uh is asking uh, favorite part of the emmys um i think it was well i don't know if it they aired this part but uh Paul Shear and June Day and Raphael coming out, and uh, I don't want to say botching their award <laughs> announcement, but they did a bit that went on for like ten minutes, and they kept doing it and kept doing it, and the more they did it, oh the my more funny it was. Uh, they, and so, I think they they uh, bombed super hard to in the, everyone except for Doug and I. <laughs> we were we were absolutely ecstatic. We so they it. did. Areas, so, so I don't know if it was on there, but the, they did this bit where they they were announcing for like sound design or something. And they're like, we used to be sound design artists. We worked on a show on a farm and we would do things like this and like play the sound of a cow and like and things like this and like a sound of a tractor. Oh, my God. That's brilliant. It. And it just, just went for <laughs> this. It went for, for so long. And then they finally it comes time to like announce the award after this whole bit. It comes time to announce the award and they look at it and they're like, oh, we don't know if we should read this. Like that name wasn't just in the presentation of who was nominated. And they were so convinced, so incredibly convinced <laughs> that that name was not on there. Like 
they went on and on and on like oh this has to be a bit and then the longer it went on like oh i don't i think maybe we have like a la la land situation happening or moonlight whatever it was both moonlight, right which one was it um oh yeah there we go both right yeah <laughs> and so like the producers come out and, and they're just like oh sorry we weren't paying attention to the presentation this name was in there it's whoever it was that won <laughs> uh and i we're sitting at our, our table just loving every second of it and like they're losing the whole room <laughs> That was my favorite part. I hope they showed the whole thing. Um, oh, that sounds incredible. I need to look into this. That was uh, that was great. But I think just, you know, it sounds so cliche to say, like, just being there. Um, but really, like, we're like, ah, oh, you know, it's an award. Just being nominated is great, and it feels it feels good. But, you know, it's just an award. It doesn't really mean anything. And then you, you get there, and you see, like, the giant Emmy trophies, and you see all these people who, as superficial as it sounds, just, like, these people who look great like they're they're there in an award show wearing their fancy suits and their gowns and like an hour ago i woke up and took a shower and put on my men's warehouse tuxedo and like just being there uh yeah no, it, it is cool to look around and see people who are obviously at their like 15th <laughs> emmy awards you know and uh it makes me just feel like i've perpetually got toilet paper stuck to the bottom of my oh, shoe. Oh man. Um, I've yes. Yeah, I I felt that way at every official every any official meeting I've like any agent meeting I've gone to, any like any I've been to a, any premiere I've been to, it's like wait, I should I should put a mask on or hide my face so no one has to see this. Yeah, it's always like, "Oh, you don't yeah. know that I don't <laughs> No, I think they know. I think like, they I know. Is is really my fear. It's like, "Oh god, I feel I feel this way when I walk out the front door of my house and like, you know, I look to my I look to my right and like, you know, one neighbor's like in a suit getting into his car going to work and you know, another another person is getting ready to coach the little league team and I'm just like I'm on my way to go play Maple League in front of the kids. You shouldn't say that. That's the problem Woo-hoo. is that you actually is you walk around saying that out loud. It makes people uncomfortable, I think. Yeah, I should take the bell off of my bike too. <laughs> matters at all speaking of uh what you're wearing uh john there have been multiple comments one from uh our good pal darby facente <laughs> make sure that you darby's know going nuts in the chat by the and... way if you guys don't know darby facinto huh? who works uh who did who worked on loki and did some of the cool ui work in that he's uh he's a fan of yours he's a he's big a fan of that's what i'm saying i i know yeah. i know I know Darby. Okay, good. Very then well. you then you understand what's anyway, going on in the chat right now. <laughs> Darby and Peter and others have commented on your coat, John. Those are calling it. Some are calling it cardigan because they know what they're talking about, and others are calling it a coat. <laughs> but they're all on board with your look. I'm uh Johnny should know how offended I am right now about <laughs> can, can you actually can you wait a second? I gotta call my wife over here and can you just say that again? <laughs> <laughs> right, that would be terrific. That would help me out. Uh, yeah, keep bigger. in mind the audience of the chat, though, is a bunch of nerds. Michael, your your mic is on, my, <laughs> Michael. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, um, back to actual decent questions, um, not just talking about clothes. How much time do you guys give yourselves to search for references, Ooh, re- and how much time do you take then for software exploration of those references before you start good actually question. having to kick out product? Ooh, uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, we never have as much time as we want for anything. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's, you know, we'll find ourselves in a position where we're like, Hey, let's all get together and, you know, share some references with each other and try to make each other excited about what opportunities we see with this project. And other times it's just like, I'm so bedwettingly terrified that we're not going to be able to land it on this one. Someone please find something that makes us all feel safe about the path that we're on. And it's more of like a scramble just to, uh, just to get things going in the, in the right direction. I mean, you know, we have some clients that we work with on projects, uh, you know, particularly when we're designing like real world technology products or whatnot, where we can be working on something for years at a time and there may be a month dedicated to getting a a large number of people in an organization to agree on like what the right kind of like references and broad intentions are. Um, And then there's other times where, 
you know, we, we need creative figured out in a matter of days and whatever reference material or research we're doing is solely just for our own internal purposes, just to give us something to, to go off of and, and run with. Oh, thank you. That was from Joel in the chat. Um, Ryan wants to know, as people who make title sequences, uh, do you object to the skip intro feature that has popped up on like every streaming service? Uh, I do. We've actually, as we've started to work on you know streaming shows, I think every every time we pitch something, we always pitch something to do with the skip intro button. Uh, There's ways to be like, how can we oh, how can we get that. around this? How can fantastic. we make it? How can we make it more interesting? How can we make it if someone does press it, does it do something else? Oh. Yeah, not a not a fan, but I'm also the person who like even before working in this industry, I would sit through all the credits of movies and like just watch it. And uh, you know, I think it's a actually when when people ask like how do you get into the industry, the the biggest thing I tell them is like watch the credits of the movies and see what studios are working on things, and then reach out That's to those so studios. You know, it's kind of the way to do it. But my but who do my, I talk to? You see the list of names. Those yeah, are the, right. those are the people. Talk to those. Just people. try their first name at, and then the name <laughs> of the company, and you're most likely going to get someone's email. It's insane how well it works. <laughs> it works I mean, really well. The thing about Wandavision is that those titles were different every episode. They mattered to the story. Mm -hmm. So family. Okay. Why would okay. you? Why would you? No, and, no, Ashi. So, but who, no one's going to skip it. No one's going to skip it because it's important and vital. So making the credits important and vital or like you say at the very least interesting is yeah Maybe yeah i think sense. the i don't remember if wandavision had a skip intro on the opening credits because that's they were technically part of the show mm -hmm. and i i don't mean that in sort of they, like a, they even they are the title the credits yeah they weren't even sure. legal credits right? so they were i think I don't recall if there was a skip intro on those. I don't think there was because Disney they were plus the had show. Been, like I don't know now, like I haven't taken a broad sample, but originally we're pretty decent about trying to preserve the integrity of title sequences and at least main on ends before letting you jump yeah. out of them. I I did notice that uh they did start adding the skip intro button to the Marvel Studios logo <laughs> itself. Oh, uh. <laughs> And it's only like three minutes long, though. <laughs> yeah, right? It's only, it's only three minutes and features every movie that they've ever done. Um, do, you, do you know how, how many of those did you produce? Every single one of them since Doctor Strange. The yeah. Marvel Studios logo? Yeah, so if you laid them like back to back. Like, I think there are some YouTube compilations that are like 23 minutes long. Uh, of, <laughs> of, of the entire history of the... That's that, that so many Marvel... Yeah, Doctor logo. Strange. I think it was Doctor Strange. That was the first one yeah, was, that had the new logo. Um, so yeah, we've done every. I mean, I don't think it's a secret at this point. Every movie is different, right? Every movie has a clip from the previous movie in it somewhere. Um, so we've done a and lot of. I don't of think people appreciate how much effort those are because they just think, oh, I just throw movie clips on there yeah, and it's, it's fine. Just a... But you have to find a clip that reads on the side of a letter inside of a logo, like. Yeah, because there's a, every time there's a lot of cool clips. I mean, you know, I think if anyone thinks about the movies, they'll think about their coolest clips. And it's always like, oh, there's this awesome shot of, I don't know, Winter Soldier and Rocket back to back, like firing guns in Endgame. And then you go to pull that clip like, oh, that clip is 10 frames long and there's 15 <laughs> edits in it. And you're like, mm -hmm. like, well, that's not going to work in the logo. So, yeah, there is kind of a, not a science to it or anything. But, yeah, it's finding the right clip that reads that you want to have a nice balance of really action-y clips and then clips that are a little slower so that it's not too flashy, but there's still some energy in there. Um, yeah, it's tough. The first one was obviously the hardest one because that was us going through all of the movies <laughs> and pulling clips that we thought looked cool and then giving that to the studio and then you know someone saying like, oh, I prefer this clip of the Hulk that you guys didn't pull. And we're like, all right, we'll, we'll pull that one. It uh, was hard even just to make a diagram to use to have a conversation about which clips we would want to tweak or change or whatnot and be like 13 degrees into the curve of the inside of the R. <laughs> you know, that clip should read more like this one. Doug, how many clips are in there? Oh, God, I feel like we every few years we have to put a new list together. It's like, I don't know, 70 something. What is that clips. built in? 
in there, wow. and then there's uh, that is built in After Effects and Cinema, and the way we actually I don't know if we have a breakdown on our site of how we did that, but I think it's a really interesting someone presented way to do it. on the someone presented at NAB, yeah, on uh, making this. I, and we I presented think, at the Roadshow one year, the first year. Yeah, so to me, the most genius and also like just kind of ass backwards part of how it is assembled is that using putting footage wrapped onto these surfaces in Cinema 4D and then like retiming the clips, finding the perfect in out points you know, scaling while cropping and all that stuff, that would be almost impossible. So what we've actually done is arranged them all in 2.5D space in After Effects. So in some cases, and please don't tell anybody, uh, they don't actually like curve around certain curves or whatnot. They will be sort of like flat, angled and you know almost each but that's other. also was points. very intentional that was very intentional too because you're looking at not just these iconic characters but these actors they don't want to be you warped around have, the surface yeah you don't want to have <laughs> robert downey jr's face like stretched around an r right so that also went to like okay well we can't really just map it on this curve so everything yeah. is done in after effects and then reprojected it's, onto the geometry. It's so it's literally the same camera move that we use that is a cinema 4D camera move moves through the after effects scene looking at cards at all these different orientations. Just those cards are rendered out as their own pass and are reprojected in cinema onto the, the inner camera. edges so that like the light sweeps across <laughs> them so that they can uh, send out GI illumination so that they can trigger all sorts of reflections on the wow. metallic floor in order to wow. you know, put together. So yeah, it became this kind of really long process, but what that, what that helped us do is we can easily edit this thing, right? If this was all kind of just a texture that got put into cinema when we wanted to move a clip because like oh someone's face is getting cut off can we just move that clip down a little bit and maybe have it start a few frames later that becomes a really big kind of process to do if that was all lived in cinema so the whole edit of the footage happens in after effects in this you know it all happens flat and then that gets put in sort of this two and a half d space and we have mats that cut the stuff out and then that gets put into back into cinema being projected onto uh onto the geometry so uh, and like camera, camera, like camera projection like that normally would cause all sorts of like tearing and distortion mm -hmm. and whatnot, but the projection itself is animated with the camera move in After Effects so that like every frame should be like a nice clean one to one match. Wow! As the uh, as the camera <laughs> moves through there, yeah. So I don't know. I guess probably when we did the road show, we really broke into that or NAB. I don't know if any of that stuff is recorded. Um, I don't remember the NAB presentation, how in-depth there, it got. There's that. some broader strokes of it in the NAB presentation, but I don't think anything goes that deep into it because it's so hard just to open those scenes. Really? And, <laughs> and work with them. Yeah. Uh, huge, huge shout out to uh, Russ Gautier, our, our former art director who uh, who put that together and like came up with that crazy projection scheme on uh on that yeah um, that was a that thing was a was a lifesaver and like you know china talks about how cumbersome that project was when we first did that that thing was done in i think it was 2k and now recently we've redone the whole thing in 4k in oh, hdr wow. so it's like and now what we have with the 4k and hdr the footage we're getting <laughs> is 4k Ooh. hdr footage that we're putting into it because if we put you know this uh <laughs> sort of like this sd footage in there then yeah. we don't get the color values and it becomes all messy we have to use this huge uh these huge files in the beginning so it really is uh a pain to open and uh and work with but fortunately it's like oh let's just replace one clip not let's redo 30 clips in this uh because that would be an absolute nightmare i mean but i think again like it's such a beautiful title because the concept is solid like we're starting from the comics then we're going to the words on the page and then we're fleshing it out storyboards like it's a good story being told 
just to say, hey, Marvel Studios logo, da-da. But, like, you know, it's not just trying to be cool. It's trying to tell a story. And I think that's part of what makes it great. Yeah, I think that's um, – I'm glad that that comes, that comes through because that was a lot of conversation that we had. Like, how do we tell the story of the studio, right? That's what it is. And not just the studio itself, but the filmmaking process. And, you know, the backbone of all of this stuff is the comic books. That's where it starts. That's the first thing we see. Um, and then it's the, the comic dialogue, the script pages, just – the concept art, it turns into sort of the the process of making one of these movies. It's kind of all told in this 36-second uh, mm-hmm. sequence. And also, yeah, the, evolving them to each film is so cool. Like seeing the one in uh, Endgame, uh, it, or not the one in Endgame, I guess, the one in... Uh, uh, Spider-Man, is it? Uh, or whichever one? Endgame. Yeah, so, which one uh, or, uh, were they... Like- Thor Ragnarok, it catches on fire. <laughs> Captain Captain Marvel was a Stanley the post. One. That was the Stanley mm, yeah. version. What was the was it Endgame where we actually removed That's what all I'm the characters of. who had blipped away? Yeah. Yes. It was yeah. Endgame. Yeah. Yeah. So we removed all those. That was um, such a great intro there too, because everyone everyone knew what you had done. Like everyone knew it had happened. Like it was mm-hmm. so. Not, it was just so good. Yeah, it, that one was uh, that was cool. And then now on you know on Disney Plus, there's uh, a lot of different intros. Like the Loki one, we made green and gold, and the Wandavision one, we did like a retro one. Um, you know, there's uh, I think even in Wandavision, we do a purple one for uh, for what's her face Agatha um, for Agatha. Um, there's a purple one. So yeah, it's been fun playing playing with these to kind of keep the same thing but then changing it and seeing how that uh how that works or you've got those up let's see um doug speaking of um doing the camera projection stuff i just pulled up on my screen uh the original captain america projection test that you had put together which for me is always like one of my favorite things about this, and sometimes I will just like at two thirty in the morning put this on loop and just stare <laughs> at it for ten minutes. Uh, this was uh, a piece of an unbelievably gorgeous piece of concept art that we had received from Ryan Minerding, um, who's like the head of visual development at Marvel Studios. Uh, and we had uh, this was one of the coolest things about the Marvel Studios logo working on was we had access to all of the concept art that they had basically wow. put together for any of the films up to that point. And we took that that image and did, you know, what was you know, we knew that we wanted to have them kind of like paint on and build on before your eyes. Um, but we knew we had to do something like more than that, like that just felt like that would be too easy. So Doug came up with this great uh, projection scheme where we use, you know, relatively, relatively simple models that we are projecting, um, the, the concept art onto, as well as this like, uh, surprisingly complex, like multi-stage, like draw on. So I think this one doesn't even have the, the final version of it, which I thought was really cool is we had these paintings and then we made, I think four or five different versions of the painting in levels of fidelity. So that it paints on as kind of a rough sketch and then it paints on with a little more fidelity and a little more and you kind of get this really wow. cool paint on effect. I don't think this one has it, but the final, if you kind of go, uh, if you frame by frame on it, you can kind of see. Um, that yeah, they're, they're a little bit like rougher, like the edges, as the edges are starting to come on, they have like less detail contained within them and that builds on progressively. But my favorite also, part of this is one of our early things. Uh, we're on a call. And Ryan Minard and walked by the room. And you just hear someone like, hey, Ryan, check this out. And like, you can hear him like walk in the room, and go, like, oh, that's so cool. Like, oh, Ryan Minard, so cool. hi. That's oh, fun. My. That's so gratifying. And also, it's it would be fun to do work for movies that you know people are also watching frame by frame. Uh, you know, the, 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 that's been a whole new most. thing with the TV shows. Mm-hmm. Is, you know, we do that and then, you know, new rock stars pops up and be like on this one frame and you're like oh god i hope i didn't mess something <laughs> up you know you see these titles like the loki credits reveals the whole future of the mcu i was like oh dude, what did we do <laughs> and then you know some of it's intentional some of it is uh, a lot of reading into things um but it's uh it's a lot of fun to see that because the movies you don't really get that because they're in theaters and people can't go frame by frame on this stuff 
Uh, but it is. Cool I never that, thought about you know, that. That the TV shows really you have a it. much more immediate. Uh, those ridiculous Easter egg breakdown yeah. videos. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's fun, and I'll. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I watch all of them. Because <laughs> you want to know what you accidentally uh, just sent. What yeah, for, yeah, rabbit yeah, holes, yeah. You, rabbit trails? You just sent people down. Like they, you just wasted that much of their life by putting your girlfriend's birthday or putting your like you know your aunt's birthday in a. <laughs> you, you you joke about that, but like if we yeah. need numbers, well, I'm not going to make up numbers. I'll put my birthday in there. We've. I mean, our faces are in movies. Uh, we're we're scientists in Winter Soldier. <laughs> uh, I'm a burglar in uh, the Spider-Man Homecoming title sequence. So, oh, if we're, that's so if there's places where we need people and we need faces, and uh, you know, there's not someone that they've told us to use. Uh, you know, oh, there you go. Yeah, this is a scene in uh, in Winter Soldier uh, as they're explaining um, this whole conspiracy that unravels, and we had this we had this great photo of a bunch of scientists standing around, and they were trying very hard to get the clearances for this image for this actual real real photograph, and could not acquire them. Oh, all wow. dead now. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah, because it it would mean like yeah, reaching out to all their estates and and whatnot, and so wow. we we solved that by just plugging uh, all of our faces in there. <laughs> so it was like every person in the studio that day ended up in uh, in Winter Soldier. That's phenomenal. In uh, in Black there were also Widow. yeah, Black Widow. There was a lot of practical stuff. How much of that was uh, was you guys? Uh, in terms of practical stuff, we didn't or do like there were like. Like I thought there were like props and like shots of, uh, yeah. I mean, there's all this stuff, Doug, that you, you and Eric and, and Peter. Oh uh, yeah. We're talking about the, like the opening titles for black. Yeah. Widow. That was really cool. Um, because that, and this guy, Peter, who's in the chat, who's saying my cardigan doesn't look good. Um, <laughs> don't look at the chat movie. guys. Don't look at the you chat. I was going to say nice things about him. I was going to say nice things about him, but not anymore. Uh, he didn't help at all. Um, we got to go out to to the set of uh, of Blackwood. We got to fly out there and shoot on set. And um, we did two trips out there. The first one, we kind of tacked on to a night shoot that they were already doing and got to film some of the actors wow. and uh, really be a big part of it. And then the second time we went out, they actually built us sets, which we weren't expecting. We were expecting to like, show up and like, we'll just find a corner somewhere. And we get there like, hey, we built like a whole oh, wow. underground like tv station for you guys to shoot in like oh we built a, a firing range and we built this you know bedroom set and like oh for us for, li- for little old us that's great um so yeah we shot a ton of stuff because uh you know it's different it's very different than something we've done before right it's all it's a really big edit it's a lot of it was editorial um so yeah we got to go do some really really cool stuff it was our first opportunity it was my first opportunity anywhere like actually direct real people who has to like act and emote and do stuff and be like fire the gun? Uh, don't fire the gun like that. Fire it like this. Like no, yeah. just just say directly to the camera. Yeah. Doug is the best. Action. And yeah. He, yeah. And now right. just look right down the lens. Um, that was really cool working on that whole thing and you know working with Marvel with the uh, director Kate Shortland and kind of um, creating that story of what was uh, Natasha's past. Yeah, you know, it's really dark too. I think some of it's kind of upsetting Dude, that, to watch. I you know, couldn't handle the Ooh. prologue as it let, but the one the opening that let before it goes into the opening titles. I, I told my son after I was like, if the whole movie had felt like that, I I don't know if I could have done it. It was so. It was like it opens on such a heartbreaking place, and then fortunately it has that levity oh, throughout yeah. that I think really balanced it well. But I was not prepared for that opening to be like to watch some children's lives get ruined, like. Oh, for sure. And that's a, that's also a good example of in that opening, there's a quick flash of a baby's face. And oh, wow. I was like, well, we need <laughs> nice. a baby. Put my daughter's face in there. And one day I'll be like, hey, when you were like six months old, I put your image in this <laughs> terrifying, in this terrifying universe. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then even at the end, when uh, they show the whole wall of widows, that's, you know, everyone's wives and girlfriends and daughters. Wow, that's and grim. Sisters and, uh, because we needed, they're like, hey, we need like hundreds of images, and so, so oh my goodness, yeah. I, yeah, I feel like that's a fun like 
explain the release process to them about <laughs> like, Wait, can you just sign the dotted line don't that's that is one i had some friends where i i asked them about it i was like hey i'm gonna put your picture in a movie like can you just sign this thing and they're cool what's it for I was like i don't really want to tell you that like you're gonna be yeah. this <laughs> individual it's just, it's this terrible life but you get to be a cool assassin um uh, you know so that was a, that was a fun process like everyone kind of has someone in there that is so cool. Do you, uh, now that you're, you know, old hands at all of this, do you still want to try new things out? Like, you know, do more, like, like lots of experimentation? Or are you pretty much like, we know what we're doing, we know our workflow? I think we always want to want to experiment. I think probably between Johnny and myself, want to experiment with different things. But, you know, there's something like, spider-man homecoming that was totally new to us because we got to go back to like arts and craft days and build things out of clay <laughs> shoot it and do stop motion and pencil drawings and you know uh with loki that was another one where we did an actual shoot like loki was built in in this uh you know this guy who worked with us uh greg herman in his basement was basically where the loki title sequence was built and shot entirely wow. so um i like i want to experiment with um you know, different methods of doing things, different styles, kind of getting like, what can we do that still feels like perception, but is outside of, you know, futuristic holographic interfaces. So yeah, that's how often, fun. Even with how the, often is the first note, like we want it to not look like anything you've done, but that's why we're <laughs> hiring you. <laughs> it it comes, I mean, that, that comes a lot. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that we really appreciate is that we're able to keep trying to find new, new territory or stuff that that feels fresh and unique um we also because we spent i mean all of this stuff that we're talking about is is a lot of our work in film and and particularly in the marvel universe but that's still only like 50 percent of what we do and we spend the other half of our time working as uh this sort of bizarre kind of like future consultancy with uh, mostly with like major technology brands and car companies and and people who are making real products who are trying to figure out like how do we get ahead of the curve how do we create experiences that bridge the gap between what we have today and what we see in science fiction and whatnot and that stuff provides such a different set of challenges and requirements and factors that we're thinking about where, you know, we're not just making something that has to be cool and dynamic and move the story along, but it needs to be something that helps someone while they're using it or, or be, you know, improve the quality of someone's life in the way that they're, they're interacting with it. And so that kind of, you know, for me, that is always like a thing that like takes anything that's about to get like, Oh, we're making another conspiracy <laughs> montage for a movie. And all of a sudden, like everything in your brain is turned upside down and inside out. And you've got this whole other set of challenges that you're you're trying to work around and, and work within. And, and, you know, we're very fortunate that we can draw so many connections between the work that we're doing in fiction and in reality that they still are also like contributing to our, our greater body of work in a way that the, you know, all the stuff that we're doing in film has gotten so much stronger since we've been working in real world tech and has made even, even stronger this, you know, impulse that we have to make this stuff all have some layer of plausibility or an underlying logic or, or whatnot that, that drives it. And, uh, you know, that, that, that for me keeps me very thankful that we're not just like, <laughs> okay, time to make our like, 12th cell phone <laughs> commercial this year you know, something like it's like that. a car company can't be like no we don't care if it displays the real speed it's just gotta some, just blue shit cool blue yeah shit there. so i was gonna say like yeah, the hummer cares. stuff the hummer stuff we did i think is a great example of that marriage between our our film work and our real world tech because you know if you just look at it removed from the hummer like it's a cool futuristic looking interface and then you're like oh but someone needs to know how fast <laughs> they're going like they need to be able to see that their speed they need to be able to tell if warnings and if it's hard to read the worst thing that could happen is somebody oh, dies. good yeah, yeah that's, that's yeah it's easy. just you know, that. you know so it's uh there, there are similar there's overlaps from uh you know from the two things but it is kind of a different part of our our brain to work in these other constraints we're like yeah people could die if Eesh. this doesn't work or if it's not designed well 
uh, and that's not stressful <laughs> at all. Uh, you know, <laughs> fortunately, it's not a... like we're working in a vacuum or anything. Like people are like, "Hey, it needs to be," you know, sure, make that bigger. Who uh, who dictates those uh, requirements to you, and what what is the function of that person at something like? Uh, yeah, at Hummer or whatever. Is it uh, because I don't know who designs that? Is it a specific team that is all about the interfaces and all their products, or is or are there weights and measures members that need to? So it's a uh, making a making a modern automobile is a miracle that any of these things <laughs> get built with the amount of complexity and sophistication to make this thing that's thousands of pounds of metal that you pour 20 gallons of explosive fluid into <laughs> that turns into forward momentum uh, for you and your entire family. Like there, there's so much complexity that goes into like the design and engineering of these things. And the, the digital systems and interfaces are becoming a bigger and bigger part of that. Like they're almost becoming like a third vertical within the car companies. You've got like design, You've got engineering and now you've got like digital experience as this whole other piece of it. And so there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of people. There's enormous, enormous teams that work on this stuff. There are team, you know, there's like a each car company has their own sort of like parliament of driver distraction folks who are there to make sure that things aren't too distracting. Uh, there's other folks that are in charge of making sure that everything is as uh, legible or at least creating certain requirements that are set up to be like, well, if the instrument cluster is X number of inches away from the driver's eyes, your minimum type sizes must be, you know, this and that. Uh, and whatnot. Uh, you have to hit very specific contrast ratios and, and things like that. Um, and it all, you know, all of it just comes down to, you know, again, making sure that it's something that uh, you're, you're not supposed to get lost in an instrument cluster. You're not supposed to be like, oh, look at all that detail <laughs> and animation Boom. and the cool stuff that's happening in there. Like, you know, you're it is it is something that we want it to be impressive. We want it to be exciting and we want it to be something where like the identity and the personality of these vehicles comes through. And we're very fortunate that we get to work on some really exciting vehicles. But at the end of the day, it's also something that needs to be designed so that you spend as little time looking at it as possible. So you keep your eyes on the road. Well, it's also perfect because that's something cover. that you need to know for film as well. It, it, Absolutely. If, yeah. if it's on screen for 10 frames, you really want to be able to understand the missiles about to hit the helicopter. And yeah, not... exactly. And that's like, you know, one of those things. In a movie, we can throw up a giant sign that says warning, and it's just flashing <laughs> red and blinking in your face and because you only have 10 frames to look at that. You know, in a car, you, you can't really do that. Um, so it's, you know, it's figuring out kind of the difference between those two, but... Yeah. So I've got I've got something I'm bringing just, up on yeah, my screen right now. now, which is um, from uh, on the very top is a scene from Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Nick Fury's in a crazy car chase uh, where a bunch of bad dudes are chasing him and he's trying to set up this ploy to get them to crash into this truck that he can see through special like LIDAR based mm -hmm. X-ray vision. And then down below is an experiment that we did for Jeep to show them how an augmented reality windshield display could help you out when there's heightened safety scenarios like an emergency vehicle that's gonna come darting through an intersection or whatnot. And when we did this, we were uh, we did the Jeep piece after we had done the Captain America piece, and we were not shy at all about saying like well, it should just be exactly what we did in Captain America. Uh, the Captain America scene is actually here. It's slowed down because it's like not yeah. even a full second long in the movie, but it communicates the information. It gets the audience to understand like what we are going for there, and you know, and that's that's what you need in these experiences, especially where you know the the core ideas we're trying to like convey complex information to a movie theater audience or to the driver of a vehicle and you know you use the same kinds of techniques to draw their attention and to and to give them that sort of sense of like situational awareness that's so cool this is just the show where we say that's so you show us things and we say that's so cool <laughs> yeah, that's so cool i am a I'm curious. Um, oh, Michael, do you have questions from the chat? Oh, yeah, there's some more questions, yeah. 
Um, unrelated to the current topic, um, when you're designing your FUI stuff for film and television, uh, do you have any input in the audio design that goes along with your visuals? Um, not really. I think it also it depends. You know, it depends on what we're what we're doing. If we have something, I think specific that we think sells the idea, we can certainly um, put our input into that. I don't know, Johnny. If you have a, I think yeah. I mean, it it depends. Sometimes when we're doing proof of concept tests, we'll throw sound yeah. in there because it makes everything yep. better. Like no matter what, like mm -hmm. just even the littlest bit of sound effects and sound design make such a huge difference. Um, speaking of like kind of crossing streams or finding different ways to stay fresh, we've actually been doing a bit of work in um, sound design and, and some other areas too, like haptics and whatnot, but just looking at ways that uh, sound, particularly for some, some really exciting and interesting real world products, the way that sound can <laughs> be a uh, like a system or a form of communication with a user as opposed to just being purely like i guess yeah. feedback or or you know noises that are made when buttons can are you imagine or, though or what it would be like if our computers made the sounds that movie computers made like it would be uh, it would just be audio chaos oh, yeah. all day <laughs> all day <laughs> I mean, even like beep, my beep, phone. Beep for every button, right? My phone is always on silent because, like, while the little clicky clack of your keyboard on your phone is like a very satisfying noise, like I don't uh, need to hear that. I've turned off the keyboard because a, it's a like message. the second it gets slightly delayed at all, you go mad. You go absolutely yeah. insane. But the idea of sitting here and working and just <laughs> hearing beep 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 even the notification that I have on my machine now, every time it goes like, like oh, go God, to hell. Yeah. I don't need that. Just yeah. stop it. Yeah. Get out of here, Slack. Yeah. Um, well, I always loved uh, the, the Wii blew my mind when that first came out, just the way they use sound and the way they took a great it from example. being gloop, gloop, gloop as you would go through a, a menu and turned it just into this soft, gentle kind of like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's like a, it was a wooden block, right? That's kind of the sound that they're. Yeah. Doing, yeah, the Wii uh, was just so yeah, tactile yeah. in its sound design, yeah. and and in its interface. Like it was a, it was they were like, we're going to make you use the thing. And then there was the brilliant mixture of like some sounds would come out of your television speakers, oh, some yeah. sounds would actually come straight out of um, beautiful yeah, out of the controller. And, and some would come from a man hitting that. a wood block yeah, next to you from over yeah over your yeah. shoulder. And just like Miyamoto's <laughs> behind you as a block, and every time you <laughs> jump in more. And you know, being Nintendo, it was a handcrafted block out of some ancient whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. They're not messing around over there with some off. Speaking of things being handcrafted and beautiful, uh, what do you think about these folding screen phones? Uh, Ryan is asking, do you think it's retrofuturism gone awry? Which implies that I, th I think that they believe that is the case. Do you love them so much or do you hate them so much? Or uh, are you a normal human who has mixed emotions? Yeah. Or no emotions uh, I would, whatsoever. I would love to. Um, my initial reaction to it is, oh, that's going to break real quick. Um, but I haven't, I haven't been hands on with it. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to play with them. In it's theory, it sounds cool to have a screen that you can like wrap else. around your wrist or something. Like, have you seen anything else that you fold and put into your pocket, and then how it looks after two months? Like, yeah. it's. Uh... <laughs> Uh, that that doesn't inspire any confidence. I mean, no question. The absolute best thing about it would be the opportunity to slap it shut. Yep. yep. I uh, miss that. I miss being able to clamshell my phone shut and angrily and def, hang up and on people. I think it's it. going to be a boon for films. I miss. I miss the. the yeah, it will be a hundred percent. There's way more acting to be and more performance in to be done yeah. with. Uh, a phone I need. That moves. I need though there to be something where when you're FaceTiming with someone. And you start to close the, the <laughs> it, it should like crush their face. Like it should be like an effect where they're just like, uh, ah, no, you're compacting. You I know, like that you just, did it slowly too. The idea of someone talking to you and you just like <laughs> listening while slowly. slowly closing it. 
I feel yeah. like it's like the the way uh, what what's the what's the Ryan Johnson time travel movie where Looper. the the opening Looper? Looper they they like butcher the guy kind of like gradually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like that, <laughs> oh yeah, that's what it should sort of feel like as you're as you're slowly closing that phone and like I feel like with the with you know all the real time filters and whatnot, it's got to be it's got to be possible. Yeah, it's got to be possible. And then, like on closure, you get a nice squish sound and one fine, <laughs> final little whimper that, that comes out. So that's you, all you, you need you to own it. Open it back up. There should be a splat on there. That's what yeah, I there should that. be residue so, like left. Yeah. So, in conclusion, strongly in favor of folding <laughs> phones. They are definitely the future. No question. <laughs> I do think bendable displays are really, really cool um, to look at, and just like the. The potential of those but like specifically folding phones uh i don't know i want to i want to play with it the phone i, I miss the most the yeah. phone i miss the most i had a sony ericsson phone years ago it might have been my last phone before i got an iphone it swiveled it didn't like open it, w- it like swiveled around like that and it was the most satisfying movement ever because you could like it was almost like having that gun from minority report where he like has to like flip the thing around in order to recharge it. Uh, the phone didn't require me to do that, but it is what I did the majority of the time I owned this phone was just like after a phone call would like swing the thing around a bunch. I miss it. It's hard to explain without having it on hand, which is why I yeah, don't have I, it. I miss, I do miss physical keyboards. Um, just being able to not look and type is, yeah. is great. I think that goes... I, Johnny, we've had lots of conversations about how cars should bring back physical buttons in cars because, like, yes. to be able to not look and turn up the volume is huge, right? Or press a button, do the air. Like, I obviously am uh, in no position to start dictating what people should do to their cars, but to me, it seems like a safety thing to be able to, like, just not look and reach over and feel the button you want and press it. Instead, you have to look at your screen and be like, ah, oh, what am I going to do with this tablet? Yeah, I'm but severely I, in camp. Yeah, you need at least a physical knob for the volume in your car and probably a button for, yeah, I don't know. Hashi, I'm pro buttons, pro physical buttons. Me too. Hashi, you look, you look, dis- you look focused. Have you been working on something this whole time? Uh, possibly. <laughs> you, you know me well, Seth. Let's go to the, let's um, go to the footage. Let's go to the screens here. What is that? Show it. I don't want to. I don't show it. I've been I've been seeing through one of my panels. I've been seeing what Hashi is doing. <laughs> oh, I just it showed it. Like, I gotta know what is this? It's really okay. Weird quality, unfortunately. Well, but um, yeah, we yeah we've got uh, an interesting balance of things. So I wanted to. Uh, I've been obsessing over uh, 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 that amazing retro screen. And I found this picture of this gentleman who's, you know, who's wearing these cool little glasses. And uh, I used a, uh, a fun uh, plugin that we've used, or not plugin, but a website that we've used on the show before to generate uh, a depth map uh, for that photo, which is kind of fun. I had to quickly mask out the glasses because they kind of got lost. But uh, one fun thing about having a depth map and uh, an image is that you can use that depth map as a displacement map and give uh, <laughs> nice. give your face just a little. <laughs> it so breaks awesome. quickly, yeah. but uh, gives a little yeah. bit of movement. Now that's and, so cool, though. I mean, did you and you just painted that depth map? He ran it through um, this I, site that he uses on the show a lot. You want to show it to him? Let me see if I can uh, bring that over. Uh, this site is called uh, Runway. Uh, let's see, app.runwayml.com. So, uh, so a, a great uh, website. It sounds like you get viruses from that website. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, that's that's so, that's just a, qu- a bonus. That's a perk of using the site. It's, yeah. Well, Free viruses. I uploaded this. Still, it helps your immune system. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's so, it's it's like an AI is like intelligently trying to create a whip up a depth mat for you. Exactly. I'm so, so excited for. So it gave me this, which is wonderful. And it's actually, this is a really great uh, pairing for our uh, new tool, Bang, which creates uh, virtual uh, muzzle flashes or 3D interactive muzzle flashes. These are really great to use for lighting maps if you want something even cooler. Smart. Um, Because it's almost just for a single frame, so the depth mat is usually pretty good. 
So I added the glasses because uh, the glasses, I think, were dark and it didn't quite register that they were there to make this moving face thing. And it was just because I didn't have a plate of a moving face, which is stupid. So ignore <laughs> ignore all that. This is all so we could have a plate. As long as I could have a plate because I had a feeling that if you took this plate and, you know, pre-comped it, you could add the uh, checkerboard effect in After Effects. Uh, speaking of just really antiquated, lovely, wow. uh, old native filters. And then with checkerboard, you could change it to the width and height slider, turn the your, height all your, the way up. use of green yeah. is not Yeah, I was like, well. why are you using the background from the show? And then I realized what's oh. happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't see that on the stream. Weird that it's doing um, that. Hold on, I can turn that off. Let me find, figure yeah. out. Oh, how bizarre. So... Question on this. Is there a reason why you'd use the checkerboard and not Venetian blinds? Mm, I just like the width and height sliders and just knowing that checkerboard could not possibly be computationally expensive in any way. Yeah. Though, though, though Venetian blinds, that's a, <laughs> that's, that is a, that's a phenomenal approach. It's another, another good one. Approach. Ah, I should have thought of that. So I figured that I could go into this and then just say channel... Uh, you know, set mat, use its luminance uh, as a mat, and get something kind of like this. And uh, it has an alpha, which is fun. Oh, that's so cool that it's showing our show behind us. That's uh, so is it still doing it. Okay, I got it. Yeah, it's, well, it's, no, I might, I might be uh, looking at it delayed. But uh, no, it's no, it's it's, it's not coming through so hot. Oh, there we go. There we go. I did Lovely. it. Cool. Except, wait, you're green now. We can see. <laughs> okay, I'll fix this. Hang on. Um, but yeah, so checkerboard with little thin stripes and then a set mat. And then I had a feeling that you could just, uh, stylize rough and edges it and just figure out a level of border that would give us kind of cool, uh, there you go. I'm going to turn down the edge sharpness a little bit. Let's change the scale of that, uh, noise. There we go. I'll just do this and make it like a 3D layer and do that three times and push it back. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, but yeah, <laughs> Seth absolutely was right that I was getting distracted. So I want to see like, you know, when you're now doing the 3D depth and sorry to, uh, to not know, this is it, but like, are you... Are you going to do something where we can use the depthy face to do a little bit of pivoting on the face, but also have the, like, I guess the resolution lines or whatnot track with that or, or can have consistent parallax? Ooh, I didn't even think of that. I mean, you, like could, an, you could use that depth map in form to drive particles in 3D space. Yeah, and then this is where or, we or get into... Analysis, they're both in the same... I think this is a a great example (laughs) of where then we would get into uh, a very longer than it needs to be conversation about what is the technology. So like Johnny's saying like, oh, the lines map to his face. It's like, okay, so is he made out of pixels or is he being displayed on a screen of pixels? Mm. And like, would his face move through the lines? No, that's an excellent conversation to be had. I think it's, it's like the oscilloscope playing Quake, like it knows that he's a three-dimensional being trapped inside the machine, but the computer is like just barely trying to figure out how to render him as a volumetric object. Where did you guys object. get with the was Zola? Was he? I guess was the motion before the pixels, or was the pixels before the motion? So it was the the motion first. So we had this. Like I said, we had this footage of him reading his lines. And we actually ended up playing it back at like one frame a second. If you watch it, his head kind of like moves up and down yeah. a little bit, but it's really pretty static. Um, so that is what's driving everything after that. And then we painted light and shadow on there. And that's kind of, you can see the lines get a little thicker in the highlights, thinner in the uh, in the shadow. So it's kind of really driving. cool. Uh, I want to say it's a mix of like form and this, uh, this Amino Squares plugin. And then... Was, a lot yeah. of layers of things of glows and stuff. I try and find it, but I think that's very much archived in uh, three servers. Like you can take 
stuff like form because you could get you know an okay effect just using form but you use form and then a bunch of other things on top of it to really build up oh, really pretty yeah thing. so i think our one of my biggest pet peeves and you know it it ends up happening because like uh, just out of the box it looks good but one of my biggest pet peeves is using an effect and then not changing anything and just being like, yes. that's the effect. Ooh, here's real, real the effects. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's it's, the it's, design. Like, it's like you can, well, you can spot red giant universe VHS all over the place. Cause people oh, just yeah. apply it and don't change anything. Like it just at its default values. Yeah. Like, no, no, you, you wouldn't do that with particular. You wouldn't slap particular on your layer and call it good with those little white particles just spitting out for no reason. Like, you're going to change some parameters. So you should do that in every effect you use. Change something, for goodness sake. Yeah, change change something, change everything, you know, make it make it your own. Because a lot of that stuff is good out of the box, and it won't matter uh, for, like, most people, except for, like, the 20 people who are like, oh, that's Red Giant VFX, I know that. Well, but, but you know, well, it's you funny wanna... you know, we say this, but then, like, there's one trap code form uh, preset that has been in every, like it was in Skyfall, like on the screen in the background. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's, it's everywhere. It's like what everyone, it's the, it's the strings, the ribbons, like it shows up every, in any kind of like corporate video or corporate, like fake corporate video. Yeah. Um, Speaking of things that are uh, out of the box, Darby wants to know what you guys think about the casting of Chris Pratt as Mario. Ah, uh, we had to ask. I, for one, am very excited for a sexy Mario. I think it's about time. I think we've gone too long. I, w- I would like Chris Pratt to uh, relapse back into Parks and Rec stage, Chris Pratt, and then play Mario. So he's not sexy Mario. He's right. uh, Andy Dwyer Mario. I'm all in favor for that. I think I think they should. They got to do a, a a flashback scene with uh, Bob Hoskins. Yeah, as I was gonna say, I'm. Uh, I think there's already a perfect Mario movie, so I don't know why we have to ruin with perfect, <laughs> ruin perfection. Uh, the best way to ruin that, that movie, movie, by the way, is to watch it. Is to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> Just watch it again. I have very fond memories I do of that too. movie. I saw that movie in theaters, and. For the next rest of my life, my dad continued to call me a Goomba. Really? Anytime something happened, uh, he'd call me uh, a Goomba. And uh, so I very, I don't know if they're fond memories. I have memories of that movie. But I do i do enjoy it. But also, you know, when that movie came out, it was like 1993. It was, a so huge, it was right before was Jurassic like, Park. So we hadn't had our minds completely blown yet. And we were like, Mar- like live action Mario. And it's weirdly dark. I, and it was just a fascinating experience yeah, right? for... Uh, people our age for, I guess for like two people, you and it's me. A great way for us to meet Dennis. Yes, Hopper it was for the first uh... time as kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, or actually, no. When when was that compared to we? I get water, water World and Speed were pretty. Waterworld. Okay. I also love Waterworld, <laughs> guys. I like bad movies. I have a soft spot for bad movies. Have you heard me talk I about Twister? World. I mean, you're on the right show here. I mean, Johnny, how many times have I used hackers as a reference for something? Hackers, oh. hackers all the time. Uh, I'm I'm pretty devout, too. And I was loving uh, your guys' episode with uh, Stu last week because I'm super devout to uh, original Paul Verhoeven yeah. RoboCop. Uh, that that changed my life as a as a very young man. And uh, that that movie is is still the absolute best. And and also makes my experience working on uh, the RoboCop remake, the 2014 yeah. remake, one of the worst experiences that I've really? ever had in my You're career. You're on air. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it just uh, it was uh, it was it was for us not generally just not a not a fun process uh, uh, working working on that movie um, was was just difficult. It was sort of you know fell into like all the things that we don't like happening when we're when we see really cool opportunities that we're chasing after and we just can't can't get them to land so they can't all be they can't all be awesome fun uh marvel movies that is one where i i snuck my name into a very prominent spot in the movie and then they told us they cut it out and we watched the movie it was bad oh, really so hey then- so that's There's why the a... entire thing takes place in the town of Appleton. <laughs> yeah, it's all Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, no, there was uh, on the uh, 
what was it called? The uh, the Samuel Jackson show, the something report. The Novak. The Novak report, or Novak <laughs> element, whatever it was. Uh, he's talking about Michael Keaton's character and flashes a magazine article. And I had all these headlines, and the first letter of each headline uh, spelled Doug H A, <laughs> and H was my middle my middle name. Uh, so it was Doug H A, and they cut it out. And they're like, oh, this doesn't look like a real magazine cover. <laughs> And then we watched it, like, it's back. All the stuff that I hid in that movie were just messages that said, like, help us. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so good. Well, that's one of the greatest things about doing stuff like this is you get to hide your little thing. It's like I, I just finished working on a music video for a somewhat well-known rapper, and I tucked my Instagram handle in some graffiti in a back wall, and no one has noticed. Oh, I'm, now we're going to look at all the videos that have come out. Every, yeah, for, by oh, every rap artist. Fun yeah, every session rap to sit video. Where you're just like hoping they don't notice the thing in the background. There's a lot of times we hope they, uh, we hope things can like sneak by. But also at the same time, we're very conscious. Like, you know, we're not going to put things in there that if they were found, it would be <laughs> a big deal. You know, um, it's all names and, and stuff like that. Names and dates. I mean, they need the data for something. It might as well be data that matters to you. Yeah, I, in uh, what was it in Batman versus Superman? I have one of my one of my buddies is a huge, huge Batman fan. Um, and in Batman versus Superman, we had a whole bunch of stock tickers, and I I put his name in between <laughs> uh, sort of the Wayne Enterprises and uh, some other some other stock price. And like his name's like right in the middle there, uh, so you know we, where we can, we try and have fun with it. Like that. So speaking of Batman v Superman, I, I've got to ask if I thought that was going to be your outro from Bruce the show. Wayne. Speaking of Batman versus Superman, we have I to mean, end this. We we are we are at two uh, two hours. <laughs> we are we are at time. But no, so, I know. Yeah, let's let's do one more question. Hear how Bruce Wayne generated logos for? Oh, that this. was my favorite thing because everyone hated that so much and i was like oh i worked on that was me <laughs> uh it's a great question how did uh lex luther so lex luther decided i found all these superhumans let me personally design all of their logos <laughs> i'm gonna do that i think it's uh it's great um i loved all the conversation about that because then you know our work shows up everywhere while people are talking about it so it's so fast. Yeah, if you're not familiar, yeah, I mean, it's just what you said. Lex Luthor had little folders or something like that on his desktop for each of the, all the info he's gathering and all these uh, supers. And uh... just so happened to be the single most hated moment of the entire film. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, a phenomena, phenomenally holds up. <laughs> Otherwise, a solid. Yeah, I think that was the only, other aspect. That was the only part, part, right? If it were like. for that scene, it would have been a great <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> top flight execution across the board except for that one moment where he opens that We're, folder on his computer what a great what a Apologies great note to end on to shitting on a movie hey <laughs> guys please come back to our show this was like the most fun we ever had thank you for coming and being on the show and showing us stuff and talking about crap absolutely it was, uh, it was a ton of fun we'll come back anytime you want us Right. Yeah, Absolutely we love, love we love that. the you know we love the show. We love what you guys are are doing and and everything that Red Giant and and Maxon have have been doing to help us with you know our our work that we do. We can't do it without having access to all these awesome tools that so many people work so hard on putting together and and supporting. So any any time, just say the thanks, word. guys. Absolutely, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I you're you're driving, man. You tell me when, and I'll I'll make those credits happen. No, I was just going to say that that uh, that the Maxon's 3D Motion Show has has some wonderful uh, food demonstrations uh, from that you can. Watch. This is a, this is a, this is a family show. <laughs> that you can watch. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so yeah check out yeah you can find out more from perception uh on uh on the maxon channel uh look at the 3d motion yeah. show and just uh search for uh some of the cool fooey stuff there and uh yeah while you're hanging around find the maxon training team uh, uh channel it's it's a, another wonderful resource where you can learn how to use all the tools that these guys were telling teach us you about. how to actually do useful have stuff I have i have I VFX and shield enough? 
to, yes, uh, next to time add. we'll we'll dig into some projects and not <laughs> and not uh <laughs> Listen, I don't know if you can tell. We can talk for a long time, and we can just uh, hang out. Then you came to the right show, and that's why we're glad you're here. Perfect. All right. Well, guys. I think John really left. I think he did. I don't know if he's coming back. You know what? I think the last thing that people have always wanted, they've wanted some credits, and guys, have I got a treat for you. (laughs) 